there are a number of very important issues um, raised. I think the, the highlighting or foregrounding of the lack of re- legitimacy on the part of the Shah's regime is a very important theoretical contribution, which is already in the book, but it's important. It's more important than uh, kind of graduate student-like attempts to explain something after the fact. So, you know, the mullahs used to get together. So it was the Dores that threw the Shah off, or it was some mm-hmm. Foucault, some Foucauldian discourse analysis, which uh, doesn't seem to, to really hold water. But this question of legitimacy is key. The fragile legitimacy of the Shah, of the Shah's regime, and, and the problem of the coup in unclassified or declassified documents uh, of the State Department and the CIA when the Shah visited the US, the officials are warned that the Shah feels very anxious and very insecure about his place and that no mention should be made of Mossadegh or of to exacerbate the Shah's uh, insecurity. However, can we also add, as uh, you know, I'm a student of history. There is a, just as you said, the 53 student movement, the consultants around Khomeini as the Qutzah, the Chabran, um, to the extent that they were advising him, they latched on to 53, unlike Sanjavi and Bozargan and Bakhtiar, who said, okay, maybe the regime is strong enough to, to hold itself. But can we also add this element that the opposition took advantage of that perceived illegitimacy to the maximum, that illegitimacy or questioning the legitimacy of the regime was a big part of the narrative of the opposition. But when we question legitimacy, I'm thinking 1970s, how legitimate is Turkey? member of NATO, how legitimate is Pakistan? You know, these are neighboring countries. Uh, Pakistan with a huge population, Turkey with a similar population uh, like Iran. How legitimate is Iraq? You know, with a far less, far smaller. <clears throat> so legitimacy was not a problem for, it was not a problem everywhere. It became a big part of the narrative or discourse or criticism by the opposition. That, you know, and I remember the book by Panun Parvar about Persian literature at the time, Prophets of Doom. It seemed, it looked to the opposition that nothing the Shah did was right. Even game shows on television were poo pooed by Reza Barahani and others. Uh, even uh, the expansion of the educational system was poo pooed by Ala Ahmad, by Shariati, everything. So this illegitimacy was played on. Uh, would you would you agree with that? This is my perspective. I'm not a supporter of the Shah. I mean, yeah. everything has passed. But as a student, as a student of history, I'm saying, can we see some kind of an irony that the Shah, who is, as you perfectly well said, trying to say, look, I'm a revolutionary. I'm giving land to the peasants. I am dispossessing the big landowners, whether it is the clerical establishment or the uh, the other big percentage of landowners in Iran, I am dispossessing them. Why don't we look at the Islahat Arzi? Why haven't we historians looked at Islahat Arzi not as not merely as a destructive force of the Iranian village, but why haven't we compared it? Why don't we compare it to developments such as enclosure in English, in British history or, or European history or land reform in America? Because everywhere we look, there are imperfections. There are everywhere there are you know, failures to, to match the ideal. Uh, where is the ultimately legitimate state even today? You know, we talk about the Soviet Union and its critics say it was illegitimate. Uh, critics, critics of America say it is not legitimate enough. You know, similar arguments are made all the time. But the fragility of the Shah's legitimacy granted. But the harping and the insistence of the of, of the opposition or on the opposition's part on this illegitimacy um, wasn't that also a big part of leading to the revolution, whether it was real or just perceived. 
and in terms of dimensions of religions of not non legitimacy am i clear in posing the question yeah well i mean i think you you in a way emphasize the importance of 53 because here um whatever the shah did even when he was doing good things the problem would be you know you doing it for other reasons other reasons is you're desperate to get legitimacy which you don't have oh it wasn't the opposition harping on this i think the context they were working was the question of about the doubting of the legit legitimacy and you could argue you know you can issue the raise the issue that you know most regimes don't have some questions of legitimacy but the, here actually max weber is important because max weber is basically talks about the importance of legitimacy and for him there are three types of legitimacy one is traditional you do something because customs rules you tradition history rules you to do that the other way is bureaucratic um, what he calls rational modern legitimacy but if those two are not there then you get a vacuum now i think in 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 the iranian context that traditional legitimacy which would have been the monarchy constitution was basically destroyed by 53 and the new type of uh, could say bureaucratic legitimacy wasn't established so you have a vacuum and as a result of that vacuum something else that comes up with Max Weber's stress is is charisma and this is where he talks about basically it's sort of biblical term a prophet comes who says you know the law tells you to do this custom tells you to do this tradition tells you to, but I tell you otherwise <laughs> I know better why because I speak on behalf of God or I speak on behalf of history with a capital H I represent forces that drive history and therefore uh, I am the one that trumps uh, tradition and there isn't that a uh, bureaucratic modern tradition to replace it so I think that explains actually another phenomena of the revolution is the uh, the emergence of Khomeini's charisma. So often people sort of tie it to Shiism, but in in a revolutionary situation, you often get such an emergence. But I think in in the opposition, it's interesting with land reform. Uh, much of the opposition basically dismissed it and said, actually, this is all phony. They wouldn't, wouldn't accept that the, the land reform was the exception, interesting enough, was the two day party. They saw the, the, the land reform as genuine, and they were actually making steps at that time to get back to Iran as a legitimate opposition. The Shah didn't want that because, again, I think the question for the Shah was <laughs> if you let any opposition function in Iran, it could basically snowball into a major opposition. So the American notion that the Shah was had a personality problem that he didn't he wasn't willing to share power went further. The problem was that the Shah realized that he, to retain power he had to have full power because any concession could snowball into something more dangerous. Well, to just confirm what you said, um, uh, year one, um, and to also. Um, uh, say something about what you seem to say that Arun Parvar uh, mentioned. This is also writing um, history of post coup from <laughs> from today's point of view. First of all, the number of opposition individuals, at least, who collaborated and praised some of Shah's initiatives are huge, and in fact. If you look at the literature produced at the time, not after the revolution, what political activists would worry, say even like Cherikai Fadaya Khal, uh, Mujahideen and others, was the large, large, huge number of opposition figures who collaborated with Shah. 
Un unfortunately, the sort of revisionist history now give credit to Shah for having even someone like Samad Behrangi, uh, even Al Ahmad. It's almost everybody in the at least secular opposition groups were involved and worked in different organizations, Sazman Barname, Kanun Parvarish Fikri Kudakan, TV, and Etelaat Kehan. Uh, I personally know that many of my friends and people who I knew who were in Bazarat Kharije, foreign ministry, uh, to just point to one or two comments by people. And forgetting even those people actually collaborated or were part, or at least work in partly in the government. Uh, this was the, at least the perceptions or the worries at the time. Uh, it was not really that the opposition, including some of the cleric like Behishti, Mutahari, um, they produced the, the books for K through 12. On the other hand, the regime was very sensitive about um, even the appearance that they are being lenient toward people who supported, say, Mossadegh. The, the, the latest, I have I read something that is really very interesting, is that Baradarin Khayyami, apparently, I didn't know that, but I learned that they were pro Mossadegh during the nationalization of oil. And then they move on, they create, you know, Iran National, and at the heights of this car company becoming symbol of progress in Iran, Shah, they make this plan that Shah is gonna visit Iran National. And uh, one of the brothers of Khayyami, this is in his memo later, that we were all there, and uh, of course, this was TV folks are there, newspaper reporters are there, and hundreds of others, and no sign of Shah and Farah. And apparently, it takes for a long, long time. And eventually, they come. And then, when uh, this Ahaya Khayyami, in particular, uh, later tried to investigate and see what happened, is that. Sawat reports as Shah is leaving that these brothers used to be supporter of Mossadegh and the decision was made that the visit should not happen. And this is way 20 years after. But at the, and then somebody intervenes and say, no, they are really pro Shah, they, they love you. So this, ten, this, is, this shows that the tension is there. I'm also not trying to say that these opposition groups or people, individuals, hundreds and thousands of them who work in different government organizations became pro Shah. They were not, but they collaborated. There are lots of evidence of people praising, even the, the Marxist groups, they fight over the value and worth of Islat Arzi. It's, it is a myth that people think that, for instance, there were these Maoist groups. I actually had conflict with some of them who felt Shah was a, an anti-imperialist figure. This was a militant Marxist group who had these ideas. Um, Hossein John, many of these stories are made by people who participated in the revolution and then now they are <laughs> repenting from their own, <laughs> what they, they have done, which I understand, but that's not really history of the period. Uh, in a massive way, and I'm now, I'm really talking about individual opposition folks because there was no opposition groups. And that of course included JP Meli folks, they all were part of the government and collaborated and, and participated uh, in the government. Uh, I think it's a myth that people, for instance, oppose. Be it, that is because there are some books, uh, as you know, uh, and you actually mentioned this, Hossein John, uh, our colleagues who write about any country that probably they are critical. These are what intellectuals and academics do, but the same people also collaborated and, and, um, and uh, you know, this includes many people that we all know. 
question of collaboration. You see, you can see this as a strengthening of the regime. I could reverse it and say, actually, that is a weakness of the regime because the Shah knew these people who now collaborated with him were originally very anti-Shah, whether they were Marxist or whether Bosatarist, and that they were being basically for personal careerist reasons becoming pro-Shah. <laughs> so how much can you trust someone who is doing it because of a career reason rather than for commitment. So the Shah really didn't trust these people. He could trust them as servants for the regime, but they couldn't, he couldn't trust them as basically supporters of the regime. And he this is really trusted anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this, I mean, the, you often the argument is, well, his personality problem, but there, I think there is a realistic problem. Do you trust someone who, who started their career basically denouncing you? Now he's willing to praise you because you got a job from him. So a lot of the uh, social collaboration was in fact very much phony. It was not a committed, genuine collaboration. To give you one example, there was someone who spent years uh, in Germany, had some relations with Heidegger, and therefore he was uh, hired in Tehran University to teach philosophy. And when it came to the uh, Shah People's Revolution, he was asked to basically sit on the committee and uh, he came up with the question, with the term, the, the dialectical relationship between the Shah and people. So here was a Marxist concept of how the regime was going to legitimize itself by having a dialectical relationship with the people. Well, it turns out the same guy, when the revolution started, was very proud that he was one of the first people to climb up the Shah's statue to bring down the statue. So is this a collaboration or is it purely a, a personal careerism that he was supporting the Shah? And I think the Shah was smart enough that a lot of people who manned his bureaucracy, he thought in the military it's different, but in the bureaucracies, the civil servants, ministers were in fact at heart not really uh, uh, royalists. Why? Because they had either a leftist uh, past or a Mossadarist past. So he couldn't really trust those people. There were a few people, let's say maybe Erbal, who would be genuinely pro Shah from the beginning. But most of the people who became actually important in the Rastakhiz party in the bureaucracy had, uh, I would say, sort of a checkered past and uh, certainly not royalist pasts. And that also, I think, made the system crumble very quickly. Okay, so I, I have quite a number of comments that I want to learn from uh, both of you who are leading Iranian studies scholars and historians. And my question was, I, I intended to go beyond anecdotes, again, structural, whether they were truly uh, dedicated to the Shah or not. Uh, that's beside the point. I'm not interested in what Nikha actually thought about the Shah. My question is, looking at Iranian history over the past 200 years, you know, 200 years, it's almost the 200th anniversary of the uh, Russo-Persian Wars, right? Uh, 1815, 1823, that time, if I'm not mistaken. After 200 years, can we say that the revolution was an important step in consolidating the state in Iran? especially the Iran-Iraq war. I'm sorry, by revolution, you mean 79? The 79 revolution and consolidating the state. So you told us, Professor Abrahamian, that the Qajar state was a weak state. Therefore, it couldn't do things. The constitutional revolution had the unintended consequence of bringing to power a dictator, a dictator who strengthened the state. And then we are now talking about the weakness of the state in terms of its fragile legitimacy being overthrown by a revolution, by a mass revolution, by a, by a revolution from below. I think you, would, you might use that language. But then this revolution 79, especially the war, the prolonged war, enabled the state to eradicate all kinds of opposition 
going to the Iranian Mujahideen and, and the left, and then consolidating its power to a degree that was not attained uh, under the Shah or before that. Would you, would you, uh, would either of you or both of you accept this formulation, the consolidation of the state, of the nation state in Iran after the revolution? I would say, I mean, if looking at the linear terms, the real state and consolidation of state is really under Reza Shah. That's what I'm trying to say. What happens later is refinement or complications with with uh, that state. But already, I think in 1941, there was a viable state. It functioned actually quite well. Uh, and it continued to expand under, of course, Mohammad Reza Shah. So when the war came, uh, Iran was able to, in terms of even rationing, um, uh, Mossavi did a wonderful job in uh, dealing with shortages. Why? Because he had a state there and he was efficient enough to run that state quite well. So the war itself, I don't think, further consolidated it. Uh, maybe it uh, brought people who would have been critical of Khomeini, rally around Khomeini and so on. But I, in the long run, actually, I think the war act may, may have uh, eroded the legitimacy of the state because it was an unnecessary war. And the more people look back on it, the term it was an imposed war, Yes, it was imposed, but it was really imposed by Khomeini because he could have ended it once Khoram Shah was uh, liberated. Uh, that was a time basically to to uh, uh, negotiate. And because at that time, when Saddam Hussein was willing to basically come to an agreement that which came to an agreement after the years of war fighting. But it was Khomeini who decided a war, war until victory, and the road to Jerusalem was through Baghdad. So it, it that decision, I think, actually cost a, a lot for Iran. Most of the Iranian casualties were done after the liberation of Khoram Shah. So I think, looking back historically, uh, the war was one of the many things that eroded the Islamic Republic's legitimacy. Uh, initially, yes, as long as it was a defensive war, it cons helped consolidate the new regime. But once it no longer became a defensive, but an offensive war, it actually, I think it, it eroded uh, uh, public support. And I think some of the problems with Montazeri and eventually Rafsanjani were over issues about the war that we, we don't really fully know about now. Uh, but it really caused, uh, I think, internal and later public uh, public problems for the re for the uh, re revolutionary regime. I think but Hussein it, is probably correct me if I'm wrong on this. It seems that what you are question that you raise is a nation state that is sovereign. It's not just a nation state that has structures in place, but is sovereign. And there are no basic, nobody is questioning its sovereignty or legitimacy in a way, not the legitimacy of a state like Islamic Republic or whatever comes later. But if you're wrong, your argument seems to be that, that Mossadegh's vision was to bring in sovereignty to this nation state that Reza Shah created, so, so that there is a structural state, but also a state that is legitimate, is sovereign, and that was harmed or at least questioned because of the coup. I think what Hossein is saying that I, I, I probably agree with that is that the issue of sovereignty was settled after the revolution, regardless of whether Islamic Republic is now legitimate or not. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm trying to use the state yeah. The sense that Hobbes yeah. is the term, not the government. Yeah. The Islamic yeah. Republic will go away, just as Hobeda's government went went away, or Musavi's government yeah. went away. Not the government, but the state, with a uh, with an ideological structural uh, mandate. The ideology may have been uh, undermined recently, but again, this sovereignty of the nation 
governments now in Iran don't come and go by by the endorsement of the Russian government. And, and I am hesitant in saying that right now because things are changing. But I but, actually think people are exaggerating that yeah, Iran but, 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 but that's what I meant by yeah. the consolidation yeah. of the state. And I'm not questioning Reza Shah as the state builder. I'm, I'm just, again, seeing this as incremental. The process that has started at then. The process that started completed. with the Bajars and already, if, you know, as at least if we look at it that way, the constitutional revolution is a turning point, is an important point. The coming of Reza Shah is important. The coup is, is a big blow to this legitimacy of the state, right? Of this state building. Uh, yeah. The head of the state is now delegitimized. Right, the head of the state in the in the sense that we get from I don't know Kantarovich or whoever. And that was a fate that was only symbolized by its head. Right, yeah. and, and and then and then we have this uh, charismatic uh, form of legitimation by Khomeini, and then it becomes routinized and bureaucratized, not necessarily in the best possible way, because that bureaucracy has led to the empowerment of the military in unprecedented ways in Iran today. But at the same time, I'm talking about the consolidation without any ethical, moral yeah. judgments on it. But I would prep, put the emphasis not so much on the war, but actually on the revolution. I would, I would say that was, you know, what had failed in uh, national sovereignty in 53 succeeded with the revolution. Oh. And that gave the revolution basically legitimacy. I mean, I would stress it's a national legitimacy rather than religious legitimacy.